Hello and welcome to my weekly question show. Your questions, my answers. As always, wherever you are, across my channel, question pops in your brain, uh, write it down. I'll gather them up and I will answer them here. Uh, I am recording this show on Monday, March the 15th, 2021. So if, uh, if you're watching this, it'll be several days later. And so probably um, you're going to, uh, I may see something that's out of date. I didn't mention the fact that SN11 uh, launched and returned from orbit successfully, or that we now have humans on the moon or the incredibly large extraterrestrial spacecraft flying above. So if you want to join this live, I record this every Monday live on my YouTube channel, uh, 5pm Pacific daylight time. Um, and you can ask your questions live. Couch asks, when is the next star party? Wah, wah. So we have been trying to get the star parties going for a couple of months now. And like, there's the observatory down in California, but there's been having problems with the power and problems with the telescope and problems with the gear. And there's been lots of astronomers who are in the system. Uh, and we've had some shows where it's worked. Um, and then we've had a bunch of shows where it hasn't worked where or times when it's work hasn't worked. People have, um, you know, their, their technology isn't working, the weather isn't cooperating Their people have family engagements, it's been rough. And now, you know, Nancy had taken it on to just produce them and like reach out every week and try to get everybody involved and, and, and make it happen. And it was just, it was clearly just not gelling. And it was the same problem that we had last time which was that everyone's very enthusiastic in the beginning. They're like, Oh, I really want to do it. But it, then it's work. And you're asking people to volunteer their time to set up at night and set up their telescope sometimes at funny times of the year with technology that can be misbehaving and weather that can be misbehaving. And it's just, it's impossible. Um, I mean, I'm sure like with enormous budget, but you know, how many budget? So uh, we tried, we tried and we tried and we tried. And I thought we had the plan. We had the solution with the, with the remote observatory down in California. And it was pretty great for a while there, but it's still, even that it's just too dicey. So, so I think we're going to try to, we're going to cancel the star party as a regular event. That's, and that was sort of the, that was the, just the tough decision that we made. We had to make it was clear that this was happening. And this is what happened last time. Back in 2013, we were doing them before. And this is what happened to the global star party. And this is what happens to everybody is that is is that it's just it's like you're herding cats that are getting rained on with technology that is failing. And to try to coordinate something like that is just it's just too hard. You know, maybe if this was a million dollar operation, and we could set up telescopes remotely, and we could have different observers, blah, 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 right, but we don't, this is volunteers, coordinating on the internets. And, um, you know, it's just, it's not a thing we can do. So we had to, so we decided on Saturday, we're like, you know, we could see what's not coming together again. And we said, that's it, we just can't do this. So the plan, I think right now is, you know, I've still got access, theoretically, to this telescope down in, in California. And I will, I will try to get access to that telescope as often as I can. And then um, I will do like a live stream or like bring in a special guest, someone who's knowledgeable and but it's going to be random. <laughs> it's going to be like nights that the clear that the telescope is working that I have the time that the guest has the time. So I'm still going to try to do live streaming astronomy, but it's just not going to be this, you know, or if one of the other astronomers is like, Hey, Fraser, I've got time and I've got clear skies and I could do a live stream now, then we'll do that, which, which I know is tough because you really want to try to coordinate this and have a, like a live stream that's happening at a set time. And you know, when it's happening and you can plan your week around it. And I feel like we can have one or the other, we can either have star parties that are ad hoc or no star parties. And so I think that's the, that's the plan. But you know, if there's a telescope manufacturer out there who wants to contribute or wants to help provide the gear and help set people up, but man, if I gotta, 
I got a tall order if this is, you know, what's the, if somebody wants to make this happen, I'm happy. I'm always happy to be the host. I'm always happy to do my part of the job. But, you know, it's we're relying on volunteers who own $10,000 telescopes. And it's really hard to who have to rely on weather. So it's a tough, it's a tough haul. So I think, you know, at this point, there's a lot of streamers on Twitch that are doing an amazing job that are they're setting up their telescopes and, and streaming and it's terrific. So I know uh, a lot of those people are, are well worth following. So maybe if you know, people know some of the names, they can post them in the chat. And maybe we'll we'll figure out some kind of partnership with with some of them. All right. So I'm sorry. Like, I'm sorry, we tried, we tried, we tried, we tried, and it just it just didn't come together. So it's and I'm like, I know. It's like one of the coolest things I've ever done. I know that. And lots of people have said it's the, just like, it's the most fun. And yet, I just feel I feel bad asking people to participate. I feel bad having Nancy, you know, having someone try to just produce and wrangle all these cats. And it's just and I feel bad letting down the audience. So I'd kind of rather in the short term, just gonna say we can't do it until we can do it. Alex uh, wins. Hi, when will we be able to directly image exoplanets in high def resolution rather than one pixel blob that we get nowadays? Will Luvoir help in this regard? We will never be able to image exoplanets in anything other than like a pixel, maybe two pixels at the most four pixels will be just the best. Uh, and that's because they're really far away. They're just they're just hundreds, sometimes light years away. And so the best you can get is like a tiny little dot of light that is there that's you have to be able to pull all that data out of that tiny little dot of light. Um, you know, and in what you can pull out of that, it's kind of incredible. You can see what the planet's atmosphere is made of. You can detect how well it's reflecting the light. You can detect the polarization of the light. You can detect if there's water vapor in the atmosphere. You can detect if there's clouds, continents. Uh, it's amazing what will be possible to be detected from that single pixel. But really, for all of the telescopes that are coming up in the in the near term, the extremely large telescope, which is going to be directly imaging exoplanets, Louvoir that you mentioned, James Webb, they're all just going to be imaging a single pixel, a couple of pixels if they're really lucky. When you think about it, like even stars, every single star that astronomers image, except for the sun and Betelgeuse, are one pixel. They are all a dot. There's only one, two, you know, we can observe the sun and we can observe Betelgeuse and get like some resolution to see its size. But apart from that, uh, they're just they're just too far and they're just too small from our perspective. So for now, we have to be really excited that we're able to just discover anything at all about these exoplanets. Now, I've seen some pretty amazing ideas like you take a telescope, you fly it out to 550 astronomical units from the sun, you use the gravity of the sun as a natural gravitational lens to use that to like a telescope to see the light from a distant planet. And yeah, maybe then you can actually see 20 by 20 pixels of, a, of an exoplanet. But that is a ludicrous mission for us to be able to do when you think about how far the farthest spacecraft we've ever sent have been. So we are 50 years, 100 years, maybe from having telescopes big enough. But who knows? I mean, you know, of course, we are around the corner from space based assembly, space based construction of of structures, and we someone may come up with a plan with a telescope that's a kilometer across that can be launched in a single starship and then assembled in space. So who knows, there might be some stuff that are in the near term that will actually get the job done. So we'll find out. But for now, just get really used to being excited by a single pixel. John Wolf asks, Are you afraid of a Carrington like event happening in the future? A little? Yeah? I'm a little nervous about a Carrington event. So for those of you who don't know, the Carrington event was this dramatic solar storm that happened back in the 1800s. And the astronomer Carrington saw this this flash on the sun when he was looking at the sun through a proper filter. 
um, from that came from a really powerful sunspot group. And then within hours and days, uh, some really powerful solar wind and, and flares and coronal mass ejection hit the Earth. And there were auroras that were visible all the way down to the equator. You can be in Jamaica and look at the sky and see the northern lights. And the interaction of these particles with the Earth's magnetosphere pushed electrons around. And of course, the only place that they had electrons was in uh, telegraph poles. And so you got these really powerful electrons sort of getting jammed through telegraph poles, and it would actually light them on fire. And so that was the damage. The damage at the time was that you had some telegraph poles get lit on fire, you had um, some really a beautiful sky show for a lot of people around the Earth. Now, we have this incredibly connect interconnected electric system, where, you know, we saw what happened with Texas with the power grid, we've seen in the past when powerful solar storms have taken down chunks in Canada, we had this really awful storm back in the late 1980s. If there was an event that powerful, there's no question, it would take off take, you know, huge chunks of the world's power systems just totally offline. And the problem is that everything's connected. You know, it's great to have everything connected so that if you want to add one more power system to the grid, then or if you want to put one more house on the grid, then everything can balance out. But the problem with being that fully connected is that if something takes down the entire thing or chunks of the same the thing, everybody goes down. Uh, not to mention we have all these satellites that are flying around in space that are at risk as well. The solution is to have things be less centralized to have smaller microgrids where you've got solar panels on your house and your house has its own battery backup and then you're connected to another house. And so if the connection between your house and the house next door goes down, or if your uh, electrical grid fries in your house, it doesn't take out your neighbor and so on and so forth. And so little pieces can go out, but it doesn't take out the larger infrastructure. And we are in a bad place right now. We are, um, we're in this time where we are completely dependent on electricity. I mean, you saw what happened in, in Texas. And yet, uh, we haven't made our electrical grid robust. And that is, we're just and it's gonna have to wait for some kind of disaster before people take that seriously, which sucks. But that is the solution is for there to be a mini Carrington event that takes out a chunk and people realize that we need to make the grid more robust and reliable and redundant. And hopefully we can get there. As it relates to satellites, I mean, you have thousands of satellites. And so if some go down, others will still be working. But yeah, 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 I am somewhat nervous. Horizon Brave. Are there any rules for booking time on Space Telescope in terms of information sharing? If a big discovery is made, are the finders obligated to share what they find publicly? It works differently for different telescopes, but in general, like for say the Hubble Space Telescope and James Webb, uh, who's using the telescopes is essentially publicly available. And the files are being dumped directly out onto the internet. And a lot of the observatories are moving in this direction. And so if you book time on one of these big telescopes, they will take your files, they'll throw them on a publicly available server, and then you can go and download your files. And the advantage of that is, of course, then other people who are looking for something that you happen to have taken pictures of that isn't necessarily what you were looking for, can look through those images and be able to take access. So a lot of the time, most of the stuff that's done by the big observatories by the Hubble Space Telescope by the European Space Agency, even the European Southern Observatory, if you go, you can you can browse just a mind bending amount of data out there. And it's just going to expand. So the new observatories that are coming online, like the Vera Rubin Observatory, they're just going to be dumping all of their data nonstop onto the internet. And then it's just a matter of people digging through that data to look for things. And so discoveries will be made by looking through the publicly available data, and then realizing, oh, there's a supernova. Oh, I found an asteroid. Oh, there's a comet. Oh, there's an asteroid coming straight for Earth. Um, and that's all just going to be available in the in the raw data that anyone can go and access. And like there's a Twitter account, you can go and see what the Hubble Space Telescope is pointing at and who it's pointing at for. So astronomers already work in public 
quite a bit. And of course, all of the NASA spacecraft, all the data is made publicly available. Like you can go and see every image that's been taken by perseverance and curiosity today, if you want. Uh, same with almost everything. Uh, there's a few that are a little proprietary. I know that when the uh, ESA's Rosetta mission was at the comet, uh, they held back the best pictures coming from the top camera, just because the people who were sort of involved from the science side, they wanted like the first rights to be able to publish their science work. But, um, but in general, science tries to be public and specifically in space and astronomy almost everything that's being done is made publicly available the astronomers post their research onto archive uh which is where i get a lot of my you know stories that we're working on for universe today before they even make it to the journals uh, we find out about these things it's all publicly available so i i can't think of a science that is more transparent maybe computer science but than astronomy astronomy is incredibly transparent and so um in general, the finders will share what they find. And, you know, you ask, like, will the finders, are they obligated to share what they find publicly? That's sort of the point of science is that you you make a discovery, and then you share the information. Um, and then other people like that's, that's what publishing science is all about. And so a scientist who didn't share their results, would stop being a scientist pretty quickly and would would have to go find a new job. Hiroshi loves you. Could a giant star have several smallish stars revolve around it like planets revolve around the sun? Absolutely. Uh, you're talking about a multiple star system. And it turns out like now the vast majority of the stars in the galaxy are red dwarfs and most red dwarfs are singletons. So most stars are solo. But when you get to stars like our sun, the larger stars, they tend to be in multiple star systems. So binary stars, trinary stars, and you can have systems that have upwards of seven stars in the same system. And the stars are going to be of different sizes. So you're going to you could have a very large hot star and then smaller companions. And the key is that you need the stars to be stable. And so if you have a three body interaction, that's not stable they're eventually going to throw each other out of the star system or crash the stars into each other. And so the way you tend to get systems that are stable is either you get the stars to pair up. As you can imagine, you've got, say, say you've got two stars orbiting a common center of gravity. That's a binary system. If you wanted to have a third star, well, you could have those two stars orbiting a common center of gravity, and then you've got a third star that's orbiting around them far enough away that it's treating those two stars like they're just one star, just one solid object of gravity. And then you could have, say, four stars where the two stars are orbiting around each other and they're far enough away that they're then also orbiting around a common center of gravity. And then you could have various combinations of that. But the key is, is that everything has to be stable. And so you've got to have where at every point the stars are orbiting common centers of gravity, and they're not interacting in any unstable way that's going to either cause the stars to crash into each other or kick one out. But yeah, there have been star systems found with seven stars in them. And, and it's even at this point, fairly assumed that a lot of them will have planetary systems too. You know, there are rules for the planetary systems as well, where that I forget the exact ratio, it's like it's something like one to five or something like that. And so as long as the planets are five times away, as the stars are apart, then the planets can be going around two stars, no problem. And then you can have the other situation where you can have two stars that are far apart, that are, they both have planetary systems and they're orbiting, you know, one another, or one is the main star, the heavy star, and the other one is orbiting around it no problem. So all of these combinations work. It's, it's kind of amazing. And as I said, you know, with sun like stars, the multiple star systems are the rule, we are weird to not have a multiple star system, which is kind of amazing. Physics police. Have you seen the movie space sweepers? I have it was awesome. We watch a lot of Korean shows here in our house. And so saw this Korean space movie. And I'm like, I'm all in, let's do it. And then we watch it. And it was terrific. It was like this really cool, um, 
it's hard to explain. It's kind of like the fifth element. It's sort of definitely a lot lighter and more cheerful, but it's also kind of dark in the way that Korean movies can be very dark. And the action was good. The special effects were great. The world building was great. I highly recommend it. If you're thinking it's just going to be some weird comedy about a bunch of um, space janitors, it is not. It is really good. So definitely check that out. Space Sweepers scrambles how many fridge magnets would it take to give the moon an atmosphere magnets don't give moons atmospheres magnets help planets i guess hold on to the atmospheres they have or at least protect the atmosphere from the interaction with the sun solar wind but the other thing is doing the work is the gravity and so even if the moon had a really amazing uh, magnetosphere, it still wouldn't be able to hold on to its atmosphere because it doesn't have enough gravity. You don't need a lot of gravity. Like if Mars had a great magnetosphere, it would hold on to its atmosphere, no problem. But the moon without a lot of gravity can't do it. And so I did an article or a video a couple of years ago, and it would take about 10,000 years. So you could give the moon an atmosphere, and they would hold on to that atmosphere for about 10,000 years before the solar wind blew it all away and you would need to start again. But you could keep up with it. And so you could keep replenishing the atmosphere and it wouldn't take a lot. And just think how amazing that would be. You would have a breathable atmosphere on the moon. Um, and when you think about the surface area of the moon, it's a lot smaller than the earth. You wouldn't need a lot of atmosphere to be able to provide a, a breathable atmosphere on the moon. And as long as you just kept refilling it, it would work like a charm. And it would be the same temperature as the Earth because it's the same distance from the sun. So if you want to terraform something, terraform the moon, just you just can never stop. Rafael Dominichini. Why does everybody want to go to Europa? Why not Io, Ganymede or Callisto? Agreed. I think I mentioned this a, a couple of shows ago that the Ganymede is the new Europa. Uh, Ganymede has all kinds of, of benefits. Let me start with the fact that Ganymede is the only other solid body in the solar system with an internal dynamo and has a magnetosphere. So you're kind of protected from radiation if you go to Ganymede. It's got ice. It's probably got a liquid ocean underneath that ice, just like Europa, although it's a lot farther underneath because it's farther from Jupiter and so it has less of that tidal interaction than Europa does. So, but it's also farther away from Jupiter, so it doesn't have that same kind of interaction with Jupiter's horrible radiation belt. It's bigger, more gravity, a lot closer in size to some of the larger planets. I think, I think it's bigger than Mercury. Anyway, so Ganymede is 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 the place that if I was to pick a place that would be useful to try and set a, a you know a base in the outer solar system, Ganymede would be the place. All hail Ganymede. And, you know, while the Europa Clipper is going to Europa, obviously, uh, the European Space Agency's JUICE mission is going to be visiting Ganymede and Europa and Callisto, but mostly Ganymede. And so, obviously, the European Space Agency agrees with me that Ganymede is a very interesting place that should be explored in great detail. And I think we're going to find a lot of amazing surprises. It's just like... Be prepared to be shocked and amazed at the cool things that get discovered at Ganymede and not just Europa. More questions in a second, but first I'd like to thank our patrons. Mysterious Mark, Lemon Lady, James Pizarras, Gerhard Schwarzer, Ron Thorson, Edward Brostrick, and the rest of our 844 patrons for their generous support. Want our videos early with no ads? Join our community at patreon.com slash universe today. Larry Beckham, how many times will SpaceX reuse the Falcon 9 booster? They reached nine times now. Yeah, if you don't know the time I'm recording this, uh, you know, there could be a new record, probably. Um, SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 with a payload of Starlinks, and it was the ninth time that the booster has been reused. Amazing. Like, uh, who would have thought that we would see a rocket being used nine times and it still works? I mean, they lose the occasional one. They had a they had a failure a little while ago. But still, the fact that these rockets are getting used and reused and reused. And a lot of times, I mean, clearly SpaceX is just 
piling them full with starlings and sending them back off into space, which is trust in their own rocket system and also a really good demonstration. It's pretty brilliant when you think about it that you've got your own payload starlings. So you're saving money because you're reusing your rockets and you're reusing your fairings, you're flying, you're demonstrating that these things can work a lot. And you're saving money and you're launching your payload and then you're creating this giant telecommunications network that nobody is going to be able to stop you. It's uh, yeah, it's a it's kind of amazing. Um, and in fact, you know, in the past, NASA had said that they weren't going to fly on previously flown Falcon 9 boosters. But now I think they've changed their mind. And so they may well very well land on a previous or may fly with a previously launched booster. I'm not sure exactly how many they're going to eventually be able to fly with but you know, it's going to be in the dozens. I they with the latest iteration of the Falcon 9, they sort of did a pile of changes um, to upscale them to the point that they were designed for rapid reuse. And so the latest iteration is really all about reuse, 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 they've learned every lesson, baked it into these rockets so that it can be reused. And the hope is, of course, that they'll be able to take all of this learning and put it into the Starship plan so that they don't explode on on landing, which can be pretty tricky. Uh, but SN11, I think is, uh, is going to be the one SN11 is gonna be the one that takes off lands doesn't explode. I can't wait. 71 come out. Let's talk volcanism on Mars. Thoughts? Still active volcanism? We don't know if there's active volcanism on Mars. Like clearly there was volcanism in the past. Mountains and mountains of volcanism, literally. But we don't know when the volcanism stopped. And so everyone has had theories like that in fact that you know Mars cooled down and solidified tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of years ago. But there's other possibilities that things like say the big volcanoes, Olympus Mons, etc, that they have been active as recently as just a few million years ago, maybe 5 million years ago. And we still don't know. Now, the solution to that was to fly the NASA's InSight spacecraft. And so the whole point of InSight was that it was going to deploy this temperature probe, it was going to bang it, about three meters below the regolith on Mars, and then it was going to detect changes in temperature, it was going to detect how the heat was getting out of Mars. And that would tell it essentially how much heat was still remained in Mars, how molten the interior of Mars was, and they can use that to be able to determine um, when the um, you know, how cool down Mars was, would there still be active volcanism. And unfortunately, as we saw, NASA Insight hasn't been able to deploy that probe, they've given up. And so we'll never know with Insight, what the interior temperature is on Mars, how that temperature is changing, and really how much of Mars is still molten until someone comes up with a clever new way to get that that discovery. Insight is also equipped with a seismometer, a very sensitive seismometer, so it can detect earthquakes, Mars quakes, um, as well as meteorite impacts and dust devils and things that, that go past the spacecraft. But detecting a quake is not the same thing as knowing if you've got magma moving around and eruptions and things like that. And in fact, um, there's a similar situation on Venus as well, you know, people thought that the volcanism on Venus probably wrapped up hundreds of millions of years ago, maybe billions of years ago, at some point, the entire planet just sort of turned itself inside out for one last time. And then that was that. But there's surface features on Venus that look like they could have been fairly recent volcanism. And in fact, there was a story that we that I just saw probably just a couple of days ago, where there's some features on the moon, which look fairly recent. And they're, and, you know, in the way that the way the planetary scientists figure out the age, essentially, of, of some feature on a on a place like the moon or Mars or things like that, is they count craters, they look at the total number of craters, and then see how many of the craters have been formed. You know, you have like a big crater, and then you've got smaller craters or inside that crater. And then if you've got say a river delta, and that river delta has craters inside of it, that tells you that the river delta is very old, because the craters are going to be newer. 
But if you've got a region that doesn't have a lot of craters, that means that that feature was created fairly recently, and it hasn't had time to get a lot of meteors smashing into it. So, um, so we don't know. We don't know. And unfortunately, the tool that was going to tell us didn't work. And so uh, engineers are gonna have to go back to the drawing board to figure out a way to learn how the temperature is changing on Mars. Of course, you know, a human station on Mars would solve this problem very quickly. Humans would operate some big drill, they would deploy a probe that would be hundreds of meters underground, dozens of meters underground, you know, every problem they would be able to solve it. And then we would have a very accurate measurement of the temperature changes on Mars. So just another good reason to have a human scientific mission on Mars. Let's go. I'm ready. Sean Marson. Hey, Fraser. I'd love to hear your thoughts on how we'll measure age as we become a multiplanetary species. Will we keep Earth based age? Thanks. That's a great question. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, you know, you can see science fiction tries to tackle this we will be like, you know, I am 17 of your earth years, right? Uh, does everybody do we keep track? Like even like, I'll give you an example right now, like we have Mars, like a day on Mars is just over 24 hours, like 24 and a half hours. And that means that every month or so you've added an extra day. Uh, a, a Mars year is like 687 days, I think. So it's about twice as long. And so if you live on Mars, then you then whatever age you are is half what you live are on Earth. And then of course, you have to sort of deal with travel time, light travel time, if you travel to Alpha Centauri, then you're four years of light distance away from Earth. And so are you measuring events as they happen now or as they happen in the past? And then of course, if you travel close to the speed of light, then you're starting to have time dilation. And so you've experienced five years, but people back on Earth have experienced 100 years on a planet that's orbiting at a different day length and a different year length of uh, yeah, I don't know the solution. Because I mean, you can imagine people setting some kind of you can imagine some kind of like pulsar based measurement system where people are like, people are, are measuring time because pulsars, of course, they turn hundreds of times a second. And so you could theoretically measure time universally based on pulsars, but the distance from the pulsar is going to change when you receive the pulsar signals. And so do you measure some kind of average from all the different pulsars? Is there a universal time? I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. Uh, my guess is it's going to have something to do with pulsars. That's that's all I can go with. Or maybe you measure time based on the number of seconds that have occurred since the Big Bang. Although even that um, you know, uh, different parts of the universe will experience different amounts of time based on their speed. You know, we've talked about this number in the past that if you're on one side of the universe, and I'm on the other side of the universe, even though our universe has started, you know, our universe started at the same time, we could be 30,000 years apart from each other because of time dilation, because of the motion of our galaxy and our star and our planet it could be different. And so we will count a different number of elapsed time over that great period of time. So I don't think there's an easy solution to this there's always going to be some kind of fudge. And so maybe everyone will just mark it based on Earth time forever. Like, you know, <laughs> because no other solution is going to be like, why do we still have Imperial when we have metric? Galaxia, do you also watch K drama? Yeah. Yeah, we watch K drama, Korean drama. Um, uh, there's been a bunch that we like, and we kind of like the darker stuff. You know, there's been some really good Korean dramas. I, you know, I, because I'm learning Chinese, I watch a lot of Chinese dramas, and I don't really like them. <laughs> They're, some of them are okay, but mostly I, I, I find the censoring sort of takes the teeth out of them. And so you, it's not, you know, I don't find that you're truly challenged by the story very often. There's been a couple There's one called the bad kids that came out this year. It was really good. 
Um, and there's a few movies, especially yeah. stuff that comes out of Hong Kong or Taiwan is really good. You know, they don't have the same kind of um, censoring <laughs> that they have to, uh, you know, they don't have to get everything approved in the same way. So, so I watch it mostly just to understand the language, but part of me is just kind of going, ah, some of them are okay. Um, but the Korean stuff is great. Korean stuff is just uh, dark. We uh, we joke about this that you know if you watch a show and you watch a Korean drama or Korean movie, you get the Korean ending, <laughs> and the and the Korean TV show or movie ending is usually a bad ending, <laughs> like like no one is happy. Lessons were learned, and everyone's lives was made worse. That is that is a that's sort of how we sort of have seen that. And then Japanese shows watch a lot of Japanese a lot of watch anime and stuff. And I love like I think this was one of the biggest surprises of the digital streaming revolution with Netflix and Prime and all this kind of stuff is, is we get a chance to watch all this, these TV shows and movies from cultures that we have no direct experience. And so what feel like tropes, I'm sure to them memes, you know, uh, are fresh to us, you know, you can watch a Scandinavian TV show. And uh, it's really great. And it's a surprise, or we watch something that's coming out of India, or we watch something that's coming out of, um, especially, you know, we've been really enjoying Korean, you know, Asian dramas. And I'm sure after a while, I'd be like, Okay, I've seen this before. All right, let, you know, Slovakia, what do you got for me or, or, uh, you know, something from South America, but, but I love this, this fact that we're all getting exposed to different cultures, ideas of, of storytelling. And I am just I'm really enjoying it. So we, I would say we're watching something with subtitles every second night, at this point, and mostly a lot of Korean, which is sort of a shame that I'm not learning Korean, I'm learning Chinese. But anyway, it's another story. Um, but yeah, if you've got shows that you've want, if you want recommendations, space sweepers, great show, but there's like old boy. Um, there's a lot of a lot of really good stuff that comes out of Korea, highly recommend it. You know, even the romances, <laughs> dark ending. Anyway, seven moody. Hey, Fraser and everyone, how and why do Novae Supernovae leave no remnant of the star itself, i.e. white dwarfs, neutron stars and black holes? It depends on the star. And it depends on how it dies, on what you get left over. So let's take sort of let's start with the smallest example, you get a star like the sun, actually, you go smaller, you get like a small star, like a red dwarf, red dwarf, fully convective, it uses up all of the hydrogen, just every part is constantly mixing itself. And so it uses all the hydrogen. And so eventually, it's essentially turned itself entirely into helium, maybe some heavier elements, and then it just stops. And then it runs out of fuel, and it just cools down to become the background temperature of the universe, you get a bigger star like the sun, the sun will burn through all of the hydrogen that's trapped in its core. And then it can't use any of the rest, because it's essentially outside of the core, it's not mixing any fresh hydrogen in. And so it will bloat out its outer layers, puff them off into space, and you're left with like the core, and the core turns into this crystal of carbon or other heavier elements, depending on what it was it was made of. And so that is a remnant of the star, right? Like it baked this center in the core, it turned all of its fuel into this into this heavier element. And then it blew off all the parts that it couldn't work with anymore. And you're left with the core, you know, and when it cools down, you get like a gigantic diamond uh, of carbon. But when you get to a bigger star, then the way they die is a lot more dramatic. You know, if you have a star that's say eight to 15 times the mass of the sun, it's going to end in a supernova, it's going to explode. And it gets this kind of core collapse, so it's building the heavier elements inside of it, and then you get these layers, then it tries to make iron in the middle, and iron doesn't produce any net energy with fusion. And so the fusion just shuts off and the outer layers of the star collapse inward, and then they bounce off the middle, and you get this dense remnant behind and the rest is just detonated away. And that's you get a supernova and you get a supernova remnant in this case, a neutron star. And if the star is bigger than that, then it the 
force, like what it really is, is it's all the force of all of this matter falling inward, you know, at relativistic speeds, in some cases, it's falling at like 70% the speed of light as it's coming together, like a jackhammer, and it creates this black hole, um, and then bounces off the, the center and creates this enormous explosion that we call a supernova. So but I mean, it's still the star, right? The stars just in the black hole. You know, it's left a remnant behind. If they get even bigger, you get to a certain size where the star is this idea of this parent stability, but essentially a star will tear itself apart at an atomic level and leave no remnant behind. It's so massive. Um, the star just goes, poof, <laughs> it's gone. So what happens depends on what the star is made of. And mostly it's mass how massive it is, the more massive it is, you get different, interesting results, usually bigger booms till the end. NorCal Pacific, you stated that you're watching Babylon 5 right now is Babylon 5 better than Deep Space Nine, which would you choose? So we're now just nearing the end of season two of Babylon 5. And it is really hitting its stride. Uh, it's so good. And I know it gets better. I remember it getting better. And yet, like, in the 20s of Babylon 5 season two, they're dealing with topics like that could just be that could be based on today's headlines. It's amazing. They're these timeless stories that are that are really well told. Uh, the makeup is still amazing. Even the special effects are great. The concepts I'm I'm all in uh, Babylon 5 or Deep Space Nine Babylon 5 all day every day. Uh, Deep Space Nine was great. But it was Star Trek. And Babylon 5 is is just a little raw, raw. Um, and I, uh, it's so good. It's so good. Yeah, if you have not watched Babylon five, you got to get through the first season, like you, you need Bruce Boxleitner, John Sheridan to show up and, and get into the sort of next second half of season two. And the show just takes off. It, you know, the, the latest episodes we watched, you know, like I said, in the 20s or so, Carla and I both were just like, wow, that was so good. So yeah, yeah. Babylon five all day every day. Like, expanse is still better. But I am shocked at how well Babylon five is holding up to to a viewing 25 years after they made it. Amazing. Yeah, kudos. Mark Carter, why is Starlink so expensive? Starlink is it depends on your perspective. Um, for I'll give you an example, right? Like, if I lived, like I live in Courtney, this, this small town in on Vancouver Island. And so I have a high speed internet connection into my house. And I pay about $120 a month Canadian, which I know is like five US dollars. And that gets me the fastest internet connection I could possibly buy. It's a unlimited bandwidth. It's a it's a gigabit internet connection. It's fantastic. <clears throat> but and that's like 120 and Starlink costs about 130. So Starlink's like a little more. And it's um, 150 megabits down 50 megabits up and a 18 millisecond ping time. So it's, you know, it's not nowhere near as good as my internet. But let's say that I moved out of the town and moved somewhere, say 20 kilometers out of the city, or like where my parents, my parents live on a small island that's outside of town, you know, about 20 kilometers away, you would be paying hundreds of 1000s or millions to get internet, you can't get it. Like it's just not possible. And yet, I could take my Starlink over to my dad's place, set it up, boom, He's got internet for the same price that I'm paying for internet in the city. So, so on a like, yeah, I, I would take if I lived in a big city, I wouldn't buy Starlink. But for a lot of people, and I'm sure there's people watching this right now who are who have only access to the internet via their phone, or they, you know, they've been on a waiting list, so they only have a, like a five megabit per second download speed. It's crazy. And there is no way to run a wire to your house. And yet you could take a Starlink, you could drop it in the middle of a town in the middle of Canada, some you know, that's 100 kilometers away from any other town that will never get internet, or have nothing more than like a single ISDN line that runs along the power system or whatever, it's gonna be garbage. 
and boom, you've got you got high speed internet. You can put it in the library, and now the whole library has high speed internet. You could you could get an internet, and then you could run cable to ten of your friends. You could share the line, and you would all have internet, and you'd be paying fifteen dollars a month. So, the the actual monthly service is pretty expensive, but not ludicrously expensive. And yet, the installation price is the price of the satellite dish, no matter where you live. And so, for some people. It's not going to be worth it. And for other people, there's there's like literally no other solution than than Starlink. I, you know, I've I've mentioned this past, I think, I really think that Starlink is going to run away with this whole thing. Like, now that I'm using it, you know, it's not great. It goes down a bit. Um, it has trouble with trees and fences in my yard. But the fact that it works at all is is amazing. And, you know, I, I know that it's geofenced or it's theoretically geofenced, although, you know, I've seen some tests from people where they take them pretty far. And so I could take this thing camping, I could take this thing to my dad's place, you know, not have to rely on his crappy internet and use a good internet. I could work from, uh, you know, from a nice place in the forest for a summer and yet still be able to do this job. So I think for most people, it's definitely too expensive. It's not going to be for you. But there's a subset of people out there who this is 100% for them. And, uh, and so I think they're gonna, they're gonna do great. They're gonna, they're gonna run away with this whole thing. And who loves your internet service provider? Who loves your phone provider? My cell phone does not make cell phone calls from my house. Like it has one job and it doesn't do that job. Yeah, I can't wait. If you want a single comprehensive resource for space news, you want to subscribe to my weekly email newsletter. Every Friday, I send out a magazine of space news with dozens of stories, pictures, brief highlights about the story and links you can find out more. Go to universetoday.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's totally free. And did you know that all my videos are also available in a handy audio podcast format so that you can have the latest episodes as well as special bonus material like interviews with me show up on your audio device. Go to universetoday.com slash audio or search for Universe Today on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'll put a link in the show notes. Thanks everyone watching here on Twitch, listening on podcasts, and to everyone who asked a question. Now, if you want to ask a question for an upcoming show, you can post a question in the YouTube comments or on Patreon, or you can join me live on my YouTube channel every Monday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Thanks to all the moderators, and a special thanks, as always, to Chad Weber and Nancy Graziano.